Well, I love working with people on a great journey, a journey to freedom by the help of God and the people supportive in the group. And uh, and so uh, my prayer is that uh, this um, session would be another uh, wonderful step in uh, your own journey of recovery as you learn about addictions, as you hear from others. And, and uh, uh, in this particular uh, session, I'm going to answer questions of men in recovery. And, uh, and so it's going to be one after another. I'm going to try to answer uh, one question every minute and uh, just really feel uh, good about this. And remember, um, these questions coming right from your hearts are unbelievably important to have answers for. And I always like to say the only stupid question is the one you never ask. Because invariably, when someone asks a question, there's a whole bunch of men or women in recovery saying, oh, I'm glad somebody asked that. I needed to answer. I have an answer for that one, too. And so uh, so here we go. And uh, so these are, again, uh, questions for men in uh, addiction recovery. Question one, I've been working on learning about betrayal trauma and wanting to learn more about how to better serve my wife. What would you recommend? Any resources uh, that I should check out? Great. So uh, again, you can always go back to this particular talk and write these down because you're not going to be able to keep up with the five resources that I'm going to suggest to you. Um, ultimately, it's really important for you to uh, listen to the video, Helping Her Heal by Dr. Weiss. Uh, that was really helpful to me when I first heard it. Um, also, he has a book called Partner Betrayal Trauma. Uh, another one uh, by Dr. Stephen Stosny. I know Stephen personally. He was on my TV show two different times. Living and Loving After Betrayal, Dr. Stephen Stosny. Um, uh, one of my uh, newest ones that I haven't been all the way through yet is uh, called uh, Help Her Heal. Uh, by Carol Sheets, and uh, uh, it's an empathy workbook for sex addicts to help their partners heal, uh, and so it's called help.her.heal, and the last book is really insightful, uh, written likely more for partners, but great understanding for, for men who have hurt their wives. It's called Intimate Deception by Dr. Sherry Kiefer, K-E-F-F-E-R. So there would be a good set of resources for you to use with regard to understanding partner betrayal trauma of your wife. Number two, what is the importance of writing my story and how do I begin to write it? Well, it depends if your story is to disclose your issues or whether you're doing writing your story out to work through your own soul wounds. So, so if it's going to be a complete disclosure, admitting the things that you've done in your life that have offended your wife. Um, yeah, th there's lots written about writing a complete disclosure. Um, and uh, the person asking this, if you wanted to email me, I can send you a document about writing a disclosure. Um, if it's about writing your story, it's more about processing how you felt about your family of origin and how you felt as a six-year-old, eight-year-old, ten-year-old, and and just just working through your feelings in high school and and telling your story. Somebody uh, sometimes it's it's to process that story to look for parts in your life where there's been hurts that need to be healed. And so there's the difference. And uh, uh, usually the request uh, for the story is about, in our case, disclosure. Uh, of where you've been, uh, but if it's a request to uh, work through your story, it likely will be in conjunction with a therapist. Third question, is masturbation a sin, either with or without orgasm, uh, or, uh, or where it's not influenced by porn or sexual fantasy? Masturbation is difficult for us when we've already had sexual addiction, but it is possible, and uh, it does uh, happen without sexual fantasy. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it talks about that. So first of all, um, uh, the Bible does not speak anywhere that I've found uh, about uh, about uh, acting out in masturbation. Um, and I, uh, what we are wisely coached about is be careful that something doesn't master you. Be careful something doesn't control you. Uh, you're supposed to be filled with the spirit, not controlled by something else, uh, whatever addiction it may be. 
Um, and masturbation uh, is usually cut out of people's lives because it's usually associated with lust. Um, and I tell young men who may be in their 16 to 20s that, you know, yes, you'll discover masturbation as part of understanding yourself and your sexual, uh, sexual capacity, but be careful on letting it master you because pretty soon you become addicted to that and you're not learning self-control. You're not learning patience. You're learning, I'll just have every sexual whim met by the porn masturbation orgasm um, cycle. Uh, so the Bible doesn't say it, but with regard to sexual addiction, we cut it out of our lives as men recovering from addiction because it is so connected to sexual fantasy or pornography or whatever. Uh, technically, is it possible to uh, masturbate without anything in your mind? Yes, technically, but very unlikely. And so it usually goes with the caution of not to look after a person to lust after them because you've already committed uh, pornography of the heart. And uh, and so, uh, so yeah, I would say there'd be a, an agreement with a couple where the addiction is behind that uh, if the men and, or wife uh, are separated for a while, that their uh, masturbation may be allowed as long as it's focusing on your partner only. Uh, but that would be a, a, a couple in recovery, like three years clean. So it's not related to the sexual addiction because you can actually still objectify your wife in a sexually addictive way and, and, and not love her as a person. You end up using her for sex and not really loving her the person. So comments on masturbation. For those of us that are three years uh, plus into recovery, you know, 400, 800 days of connection to days clean, where do you draw the line between being gracious to and never challenging a triggered wife who is speaking in very ungodly ways and setting a healthy and biblical boundary uh, of not accepting being spoken to in an unloving or disrespectful way by your spouse? Okay, so so first of all, God bless you over and over for being, uh, you know, 400 to 800 days clean. Good for you. Now, pretend you have no addictions, right? Pretend you have no addictions and your wife is treating you disrespectfully. You need to handle it the same way, whether or not you're, you know, four to 800 days clean or not. Um, if a wife is speaking to you disrespectfully, uh, you need to say something like this. Look, I know I failed you. I know that um, I've made mistakes that have caused you some hurt. Uh, but but the way you're speaking to me really hurts me. And I need to take a break from this discussion. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude. Uh, and I, you know, if you want to talk to me, let's talk. But we need to do it in a way that is more constructive than this. Um, I'm not judging you. Uh, and you have a lot of pain that you're working through. And I want you to do that. But I just, uh, I don't feel this is fair. You got to be careful on coaching your spouse on what they need to be doing that you know be careful in you calling them unfair be really careful just tell them that you're, you're being hurt by what they're saying and that you need to take a break from the discussion that's likely the best thing to do in recovery uh, as we gain sobriety and healing healing it feels like our wives start to nitpick about things that wouldn't have come up prior to the disclosure and discovery uh, what is going on and how can we see it for what it is and have empathy and support them during these interactions and not get frustrated? Well, first of all, I love the question that you're asking about how to deal with this in an empathetic way. Like, that's miraculous. That's good because men who struggle with addictions are not good at empathy. And so, uh, yeah, first of all, um, uh, just, just, you know, once you've got a, a blister on your heel from a new pair of shoes, you really need to let the the blister heal before you keep wearing those shoes again. And even if you put a bandaid on it, it still hurts your heel in that new shoe. It takes a while to break in the new shoe. And right now the new shoe is breaking in your foot. And so in the same way, there's so many little things that trigger your wife, that cause her hurt, that cause her to be triggered. And uh, remember, read the document about what to do when your spouse is triggered. Read that document, and that's the best way to respond. And I would say, first of all, God bless you for being four to 800 days clean. Like, I'm really proud of that. So thumbs up there. But, but I would read that document, and I would say that I'm going to be patient with my spouse virtually as long as I've been addicted. 
You say, well, Dave, I've been addicted for 10 or 15 years. Do I have to put up with that? Well, no, but you got to be patient on her recovery and her recovery does need to be um, taking responsibility for negative emotions towards you. Now she's hurt, but uh, you know, it's scripture is clear for her in your anger, wife, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down with you still angry, get over it. Uh, I don't mean get over it like smarten up. I just mean that we have to work it through. And, uh, and so that would be uh, the right way to likely handle it. Number six, how do we uh, maintain and even grow our love and quote, like for our wives during recovery when it feels like they dislike or even hate us. They often are cold and distant and they seem to get upset at, at us over seemingly minor irritations. Again, the minor irritations is like the, the, the rubbing of the heel after you've got a blister. It just hurts. Um, so uh, again, uh, uh, right now, all God asks you to do is treat your spouse in a way that is loving. Treat your spouse in a way that shows honor and respect for them. You start building a, a legacy of consistency, of love. Um, and uh, and remember, they're on a huge journey. I mean, once you've got to the point of disclosure and you're doing work, now their work has begun. And they didn't even ask for this work. So sometimes they're angry because they even have to do this work because of you. Let alone they got their own hurts to work through uh, with regard to... Uh, with regards to the journey. So how to uh, maintain or even grow our love? Uh, consistent commitment to love well, uh, replacing your selfish behavior of the past. And so now live selfless, putting your spouse first as best you can and do that for the long haul. Number seven, is a wife biblically justified in divorcing her husband because of his active participation in the porn masturbation orgasm cycle? Well, the one the scripture that speaks most clearly to this is Matthew 5, uh, 31 and 32. And uh, it says that a man shouldn't divorce his wife. The exception clause is sexual immorality, which is acting outside the covenant of marriage. Um, and, uh, and I think what's critical uh, in this uh, question is his active participation in porn masturbation orgasm. You see, if he has face that and is not um, acting out anymore, he's on a recovery journey. But if he continues to act out with looking at pornography and lusting after the women he sees on the screen, then it's clearly he's being unfaithful to his wife. Um, and, 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 and sexual immorality is acting outside the marriage. And uh, when you say, well, I'm not really acting outside the marriage. Well, your brain sees it as real right? It sees it as real. And, and when, when the, Jesus said this, um, in, you know, in the first century, uh, he, he said this because there was no print material. There was no movies. There was no magazines. And so a sexual unfaithfulness was actually being engaged with a real person. And, and even the fact, go way back to Job 31, 1, where it says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young person, a young woman, a young man. And so, so the idea being is desiring to be a, a life free of lust. And, uh, and so, so, so biblical justification for divorce, if the participation with pornography continued with relapse after relapse, I would say that she is a right because of your unfaithfulness to consider walking away from you because you're not taking your recovery serious. Uh, why do some guys, number eight, why do some guys see all clear days in the hundreds consistently while uh, others are consistently uh, resetting uh, because of relapses either weekly or monthly? Uh, is it a simple matter of choosing between recovery or relapse? Well, first of all, there's nothing simple about recovery. Okay, so it's not a simple matter ever. But these are some of the things that I think are critical for those men who are getting freedom. First of all, a complete surrender to God and actually dealing with your stuff. Uh, secondly, a surrender to a process. Most men do not get out of their sexual addiction walking it alone and not being in a process where you're committed, there's structure to it, a program, there's people you're accountable to. And the core thing is that you have to deal with your soul wounds, which made you vulnerable in the first place to, to the addictions. And so uh, those men that are getting freedom are men who are staying in the program, working through the program, staying accountable. And then even when they get a year clean and are going to walk away from regroup, 
They have people they're accountable to. They have a plan and process. Their pastor, their counselor, and their wife are all good with them leaving regroup. So that's why these people are getting free and clear. Number nine, I would like to know the benefits of separating uh, from your spouse, even if it puts on strain on the finances. I've heard one source say that you shouldn't separate in the marriage if you're working towards reconciling. A complicated thing in each situation is different. Sometimes the spouse needs to uh, walk away and be separated because the hurt is so deep. You need to honor that. And uh, I know financially it's hard. That's why uh, you don't want to be, you know, renting another place. You may want to separate and, you know, stay in the, uh, you know, a bedroom of a, a brother's place or stay with your parents for a while or, you know, stay in a, uh, in, in a room of uh, a caring friend or something. Um, uh, you know, so you don't put financial strain on the separation, but if she needs a time out from the relationship and just seeing you is a trigger, uh, you may want to get some space. Now, sometimes couples can live in separate rooms in the house. Um, sometimes that's not easy. And if you have little kids separating, uh, it, it puts her under more pressure because she's now has to do most things and is, doesn't have your support in those things. So be careful uh, on, uh, you know, separating because it becomes easier for you. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes separation is a step for divorce, but sometimes separation is the wife saying, I need to know you're serious about this, that you're going to get the help you need. I need you to agree to these things. And, 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 and sometimes I call it separation with the purpose that, that the wife is asking for separation because she wants to know you're serious, wants to know that you really love her, wants to know that you're really willing to do the work, go to counseling or whatever, right? And so uh, there's some thoughts on separation. Number 10, how do you feel, uh, sorry, how do you manage fear? I struggle with courage and would like to know uh, what to do when I become truly afraid of something. Um, this gentleman who asked this question, I am, I'm really proud of you because most men don't like to admit we have fears, but there's a whole bunch of men on this call. Matter of fact, a whole bunch of people in the recovery program who are filled with fears and uh, um, you manage fear by first of all, admitting you have it. Uh, secondly, you realize uh, what are the sources of my fear? And I need to address those sources of my fear uh, to see which of those are valid and what can I do to address those things? Because uh, if I'm fearful because a bear is coming, you know, into my garage while I'm, you know, you know, cleaning out the garbage, uh, you know, that's a legitimate fear uh, because the bear might want me or what's in the garbage can. And I need to certainly leave the, uh, the garage. But um, so but what I really like is that for the fears that we face, we need to develop a set of anchoring uh, truths uh, because um, uh, most of the time our fears are inordinate. They're, they're, they're extreme reactions to something that is giving us uh, an uneasiness and we need to have anchoring truth. And so for the person who asks us, I challenge you to go to my website doingfamilyrights.com, I should say our website, and uh, and look for the article called Fear is a Liar and the article of the Downward Spiral of Worry. Both should be there. Uh, certainly Fear is a Liar is there, and, and that should be of help to you. Uh, number 11, what would you say are the most important aspects of prayer? I kind of like this one, a little different from just straight uh, recovery questions. Uh, so I, 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 this is what I believe. Honesty, over hypocrisy. I need to go to God being honest. He sees me anyway. So I, I even fool myself sometimes and, and, and see myself coming to God in a better place than I really am, uh, as opposed to just humbly and honestly owning my stuff and asking God to help me. I think secondly, consistency is a really critical thing for prayer. Uh, don't just be praying every day for for uh, an eight days and then you don't pray for three or four and then you pray one and you know just just be committed to a sustainable habit of praying five to seven minutes every day uh, and that consistency is really cr really critical. Uh, then thirdly, you need to have a real openness towards God, asking God to show you your blind spots, giving His Holy Spirit freedom to convict you of sin of things you need to deal with, and then go to God on those issues that you need to address. And so there's some of my thoughts on prayer. Um, number 12, what is a sexual fast? What is the point of one? Who should do one? 
who shouldn't do one, what are the parameters, and what to do uh, um, with your spouse to connect instead of sex. Okay, that's loaded. There's a lot of great questions there. Um, so a sexual fast is agreeing for a season of time that you're not going to be intimate with your spouse. There are many people in addiction recovery that suggest a 90-day fast once the disclosure comes out. You see, the addiction can't keep driving you. And, and uh, even though you may not be looking at porn, too often we objectify our wife and we continue an addictive pattern sexually by basically objectifying our wife and using her uh, instead of the porn masturbation orgasm cycle. So often it's seen as a reset, a sexual fast is a reset where you have the right focus, that you're learning to love your wife and it is about her and sex is mutual, not just about yourself. It's also time for your spouse to heal. The, through the betrayal uh, and just she doesn't want to be close to you and and you know a cross between seeing you as a trigger and then being sexual with you when she imagines herself seeing you looking at porn and masturbating she uh she's offended and she's hurt by that so it's time for your spouse to heal and uh it's also really important uh, to learn to live without sexual release you can't live without air. You can't live without water. You can't live without nourishment. And you frankly can't live without sleep. But you can live without sex. But most addicts have never experienced that. That, that no, are you kidding me? I, other guys can maybe live without sex, Dave, but I can. My sex drive is bigger. I've heard that so many times. And so, so a sexual fast could actually meet all of those, um, those reasons for why you would do one. Uh, Thirteen. Uh, can you speak of the importance of getting to the roots of our addiction and how we uncover them? Okay, so uh, the roots of our addiction really comes down to uh, what made us vulnerable. Uh, and it might have been just parents who were not good at coaching us and you might have not have a whole host of wounds, uh, but you got addicted early because the lack of attention and involvement of your parents in your life. So just because you were sexually addicted at 10, 11, 12 does not mean that that you had massive soul wounds. It just might have been that you were left uh, unwatched and uncoached. That being said, many people are stuck with an addictive pattern because when they get to places like uh, uh, feeling low about themselves, feeling angry, feeling disrespected, feeling belittled, feeling rejected, these are triggers that go back to soul wounds deep inside where I was um, I was hurt by mom, dad, uh, something that happened in my uh, early teen years. Uh, I might even been abused as a little guy. Uh, and uh, and it kind of sets in motion uh, this kind of thing. And uh, we need to get to the roots of the inner pain that might have left us vulnerable to just going back because we go to this fantasy world to get out of the real world where we've got a lot of pain. And, uh, and so how do you uh, uncover them? Uh, you just uh, go on a journey, often with a counselor, but go on a journey of uh, reviewing your life and the feelings you have about your life, you know, from, uh, you know, five to 10, 10 to 15, uh, and, and recall all the different hurts that you experienced and where you're at in those relationships today. Uh, how do I reconcile uh, with my wife who doesn't want me to talk to her? All right. Um, so recognize that your wife is in a healing process and uh, maybe doesn't want to see you, doesn't want to talk to you. Uh, and so you're on a journey of just being faithful and giving her room. Uh, you 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 only reconcile when two people are in agreement because reconcile is two coming back together right now you are living uh as it were alone in the reconciliation you're ready to reconcile but in the meantime you are living humbly living honestly you're living accountable you're doing the program you are seeking the lord you are treating her impeccable you are doing everything you can so the reconciliation is ready to go when she's ready to go she is hurting still and uh, the fact she doesn't want to talk to her don't pressure her matter of fact everything you do in recovery after you've hurt her so bad is you do with permission uh you're okay if i come and sit down in the room with you are you okay with that um, uh, are you okay uh, 
if I ask you a few questions about how you're doing, are you okay uh, if I give you a hug? Um, and and just, just do everything you can with her permission because you have done so much to hurt her without her permission as uh, she deserves to know that. Number 15, how do you protect your children from porn? Example with exposure at school, whatever. Person who asks this obviously has younger kids. Um, I would suggest that you go to the website doingfamilyright.com and uh, I write an article for parents of um, five to seven year olds. It's called Naked Pictures. So go to the DFR website and type in Naked Pictures. And uh, for those young children, there's a really good discussion uh, because not just uh, at school, but they could be at their cousins and an older cousin might show them uh, some pornography. Uh, it might be themselves online. They're you know on an iPad, they're playing some game and there's a pop-up. And so we need to coach our kids of what to do when naked pictures um, pop up on a screen or friends expose them to that. There's also a, a really good podcast, an audio podcast on what to do uh, if you find out your kids are looking at porn. I also uh, was interviewed by Covenant Eyes uh, about exactly that question, what to do if, if you discover your kid is looking at porn. And uh, so there's lots of good resources, even a talk on how to talk to your kid about pornography. And that'd be more like the 9, 10, 11 year old. And so there's lots on the website about that one. Uh, number 16, when is it, if ever appropriate, to talk to your children about your sexual addiction. I would say a lot of it depends on the age of your kids. Uh, if your kids are kind of 12 and up and are facing uh, um, you know, temptations in the area or certainly uh, possibly could go there, I think it'd be important for you to admit that I've had struggles in this area and I'm actually, uh, it actually got a hold of my life for too long. I'm, I'm sad to admit that, but I'm working it through now and I want to be, uh, be a, a man with integrity and be clean. Um, and so son, it would be a really good thing if you didn't. Um, but if the kid is young, we don't want to give them more trauma by telling them something that, that they're not um, uh, able to cope with, able to handle. So uh, the whole scope of your addiction, uh, in agreement with your spouse, you may uh, tell uh, adult children, you know, 16 and up, uh, a little bit of what's going on. Of course, sometimes the spouse, especially if acted outside the marriage, wants to tell uh, the whole story uh, because she's hurt and people are wondering, well, what's right or wrong with mom? And she can't give the reason why she's uh, upset. And so... Uh, yeah, so so be cautious. Uh, tell some to, to give warning. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, be careful on exposing them to too much trauma um, by what you say. But also, uh, you know, uh, to say that, you know, uh, to take the pressure off your spouse as the kids are getting older, like 13, 14, 15, that listen, uh, you know, dad has made some mistakes that have hurt mom. And when you see her distance sometime, it's on me, not on your mom. And you may not give all the details of why, but you may also give, as it were, an out for the spouse who is having to try to hide her pain. Uh, 17, how do you protect your daughters from boyfriends with porn exposure? Uh, or addiction, given the sexually explicit and accepting nature of today's day and age. Well, you know personally the harm of what uh, a porn or sexual addiction has done to your marriage. And so uh, I um, categorically, uh, I uh, would be asking, you know, my future son-in-law, um, you know, what have you done with porn and how long you've been free? And matter of fact, I have an article called uh, uh, Loving with Your Eyes Wide Open. Open, And it's designed for people before they get engaged. And one of the 10 sets of questions is actually talking about your sexual history, in particular about porn. And, uh, and so I think it is really important uh, to uh, encourage your daughters to uh, ask their boyfriends about, uh, you know, uh, porn exposure and uh, and what they've done to deal with it. And uh, that that, you know, you, you know, I've, I've told uh, one of my friend's kids that I won't marry you guys until you're one year free of porn. Uh, why? Because why get that new spouse all crushed and hurt because the addiction hasn't been dealt with? 
And so I would uh, I would make sure that um, uh, matter of fact, um, I did uh, uh, five premarital counseling last year and three of the five guys struggled with addiction and uh, and uh, sexual addiction. And uh, I told them, I said, OK, here's the deal. Uh, you don't need to go into a program because you've said that you've dealt with it now. But if you relapse after you're married, uh, you got to contact me and get into a program within the next two weeks after that. Because you know, why should she continue to be hurt by him acting out with his old addiction that he said he's dealt with uh, and not? So uh, there's some suggestions there. Uh, number 18, do your wives define the difference between porn versus what's on the edge of too sexually explicit. Well, first of all, uh, you need to be agreement with your spouse of what's what's appropriate with you as a couple. And uh, and right now, my thought would be, don't even be anything near what's on the edge. You when it's on the edge, it's already sexually arousing to you. So so kind of stop, stop, stop. Don't don't go close to the edge. It's, it's how pure you can stay, not how close you can get to the edge, but it's not really porn. That's a, that's an addict lying to himself. Okay. So, so, so don't go there. <clears throat> and so, um, I, I mean, clearly I'm, I'm pointing to my, uh, my living room where my wife and I watch movies together and, uh, there will be some scenes that are inappropriate. I got the controller. I push, uh, advance and it goes 30 seconds ahead. If we look and see it's not quite enough, we'll do it a second time. And usually within a minute, those sex scenes are open. I don't need to watch someone else making love. I don't need to watch someone else, you know, having a sexual experience with someone. Who cares? But but so, so you know, and that's me just wanting to be pure. And, and, and my wife and I are watching together and we, we have a delightful sex life. Been married 49 years and still attracted to this gorgeous lady. And, uh, and so, so, but this is where you need to, um, first of all, what's on the edge of too sexually explicit, get away from the dang edge. Okay. And so uh, it, it's not her deciding. It's actually the two of you agreeing together of what is um, going to be our line as far as uh, something sexually explicit in, in a movie. Uh, when does our sexual desire designed by God become obsessive, uh, destructive, and harmful? Well, first of all, if you're acting outside the marriage with porn or uh, another person, obviously. But when the addiction is actually controlling you, it has mastery over you. Um, and, and that when your sexual desire is more about having sex with your wife <clears throat> and not making love to her, that it's not holistic. And especially if it's one-sided sex, where you're not doing a good job of meeting her needs. And, uh, and so uh, obviously uh, uh, destructive, harmful, obsessive is where it's all about you. It's for your needs and your gratification and your wife is even objectified. Um, but remember, uh, sexual um, appetite, a God-given sexual desire is indeed God-given. And it is designed to draw us to our spouse. I mean, I can testify that, uh, first of all, I've been unique to Donald in my whole life, never been sexual with anybody else. And uh, and I am an old man and I'm still drawn to this gorgeous woman because there's been nobody else there. My life hasn't been filled with a bunch of porn. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of comparison. I don't ogle over women who are showing best breasts and uh, butts and everything uh, online, uh, you know, whether it's uh, movies or videos or whatever, I just, I just don't go there. And so there's no comparison and that's where we need to go. Uh, how can you tell if your wife has fully forgiven you? I think it's an attitude of warmth towards you. Um, uh, and, and of course, the other one is she doesn't keep repeating the matter. Well, we wouldn't be here if you didn't, you know, uh, I got all this trauma because of you. And, and, and she's really forgiving you when there's an attitude of warmth towards you. Uh, she actually says it and lives that she forgives you and doesn't repeat the matter. That would be kind of a sign that she has forgiven you and she moves towards you in warmth. Number 21, when do you, if ever, uh, go from a recovering addict all porn influence to so simply being a guy with a sexual appetite for his wife. Well, I be very fair. Uh, when do you go? I, I like to be three years. 
three years of being clean from porn uh, and you've healed the memories. I often say, uh, and this is not a, uh, a, a measured research statistic, it's just an anecdotal thing, but two minutes, two years. When I look at something pornographic for two minutes, it's in my brain for two years. And it's going to take a while to flush the system and get out all the images and be unique to your spouse. And so, uh, yeah, when you go from being a recovered addict, uh, well, you're going to always be a recovered addict. Hallelujah. I'm a much loved child of God on my journey to freedom by the help of God and my brothers here. That's correct. Um, but but a, a guy with a sexual appetite to his wife, when it is an other centered thing, when you're seeking to it be mutual uh, and an article that I'm still writing that I, I need to push myself to get done. But the difference between making love and having sex, and that will help a lot of you in this regard. Uh, number 22 out of 26. So we're rounding the clubhouse turn almost there. Why is it okay for my wife to masturbate, but not a man? Assuming neither is not driven by porn or lust for other people. Well, uh, if there is uh, been no porn history, uh, we have to be careful that whether it's the husband or the wife, if it's uh, addiction to masturbation, it would pull you away from being, uh, as it were, addicted to your spouse. So if it's uh, masturbation because you're apart for a while or whatever, uh, that would be something you would agree to as a couple. Uh, but I would say delay that until you're fully um, worked through your addiction. Um, but I don't know that it's okay for the wife and not for the man. Remember, we tell men in addiction recovery that they can't uh, masturbate for a, a season until their wife says it'd be okay if they were apart or something because it's so connected. It's porn masturbation orgasm and it goes from there to fantasy masturbation orgasm you don't have to be looking at porn but you you masturbate with all kinds of images that are stored in your memory uh for a long time and so uh so yeah i don't think that it's okay for women and not okay for men we're not supposed to um lust after other people uh and so uh, a discussion once you're free and recovered uh with your spouse about uh the the right to masturbate within your marriage 23, why can women freely drool over other men in movies? And uh, the person uh, names uh, attractive uh, male uh, actors right now, but the guy is chastised for finding any female attractive and sexy. Well, that's that's not fair. It's not right. So so uh, it, it maybe in the, the man who's asking this question, it's okay for her to, you know, oogle these guys and, you know, et cetera, but it's not okay for you because you're a sex addict. No, 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 that's, that's bogus. You, you can't look, but neither should she be able to, uh, you know, ogle these men and uh, drool over them and, you know, whatever that, that is uh, inappropriate. And um, yeah, you just keep your eyes clean and let your wife's journey be your wife's journey, but it isn't fair. 24, uh, when are you no longer all clear with your eyes? Can you walk through the process of bouncing the eyes and when bouncing turns into lingering? Uh, when do you call for a reset on your all clear count with your eyes? Uh, well, first of all, um, I use the expression, the second long look. You see, see, if I am walking in a mall and I see, uh, gee, a real attractive young woman coming towards me with maybe, uh, you know, some, uh, for me, attractive features, whatever those are, you know, boobs, bellies, butts, whatever. Um, and uh, I, to notice her is one thing. But to make a choice to kind of have a good stare up and down as she's going by or go, going a second time to look her way is when that second long look is what kills me. That second long look is intentional on my part. And I would say it's wise to be really strict at first. And instead of fooling yourself that you're, you know, you're, uh, you're, you know, you're scoping all these women, but you know, I'm not undressing them. I'm just, you know, I'm just having a look. Well, no, no. Once you see that there's an attractive woman coming that way, um, that is a, a tempting, uh, you know, for you, 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 then you just, you just, Focus on something else. You look away. And uh, and also, uh, if you find yourself sexualizing almost any woman you meet as you're, you're, you're checking out her frame, her, her rack or whatever, uh, you need to start focusing on people's eyes. When you're interacting with female co-workers, 
or uh, you know uh, young couples together and you're with you know other people's uh, uh, spouses um, just you interact um, limited and also eye contact and uh, don't be scoping and so I would say that's better to admit that you've scoped other people and that you did a second long look to sexualize them and uh, I would I would say that's the time to break your all clear and just say, look, uh, honey, I, I'm, I'm going to reset because I sometimes uh, notice a pretty woman and I'm trying to uh, not sexualize that person uh, by not even having a second look. And I sometimes I get tempted. I take a second look and I don't want to be that man. I want to treat that woman with complete respect and not sexualize and objectify them. I also want you to know that I walk in complete faithfulness to you. And so I'm resetting because of that. Boom. Similar questions uh, with the area of thoughts and lust. Where is the line? And what is the difference between resisting temptation and entering into lustful thoughts? At what point do you call for reset for that? And so with this uh, gentleman who's asking that question, if you go back into the um, the doing family right um, uh, archives of this uh, recovery teaching, I have a whole talk about when does temptation become a sin. And so I would insert that talk right in here because it's a very fuller answer than the one I'm going to give here in a, a moment or two. Um, so, so it comes, it comes, whether I'm, uh, stimulated by uh, someone I see where I see I'm visually stimulated or it's only fantasy in my mind of things I've seen before and I'm replaying footage uh, understand that uh, I really uh, I really gotta honestly own the fact that I am going from Oh my goodness, my mind, because you have a thought flash. This is right out of the, the, the talk I do. You have a thought flash and you don't always control the thought flashes. And the, 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 the less porn you look at, the longer you look at, you'll have less thought flashes. But initially you're going to have a thought flash to either think about something for your past or sexualize somebody. And, and it's what you do at that point, that thought flash that you, uh, yeah, you need to, uh, you need to address. And, uh, and so, yeah, uh, if you have, entertained lustful thoughts and objectified people and dwelt there instead of saying jesus help me um uh, because i you know how to overcome temptation another talk that i did i uh, would give you a lot of helps there uh last question what about sexual dreams uh uh you're not acting out in person with the dream but just the dream itself okay first of all we're not accountable for our dreams directly but what happens is if I have filled my mind for many, many years uh, with all kinds of porn material, that is going to come out of my dreams uh, repeatedly. I, I think uh, if I woke up in the morning after a sexual dream, I would say, okay, God, uh, continue to uh, strengthen me to be a man of integrity, uh, clean out my heart, clean out my mind. And over time, those sexual dreams will uh, discontinue. But having a sexual dream is more of an indication that you've had a sexual past than that you have failed. It's uh, the dream itself is not sin, uh, but it is a reminder that you've got a ways to go to uh, purge your mind of just all kinds of data in the area of uh, sexual explicitness. Wow. Uh, fabulous, fabulous questions. And just to say that uh, we will continue from time to time answering your questions. Uh, and, and I pray that uh, that was encouragement for you in the area of uh, men desiring recovery and uh, dealing with your questions. Uh, great job. Great job.